here on the Minerals Test 11. This one here is pretty important because anytime anybody does any kind of work on anything, it's got to do with uh, uh, it's got to do with airbags. And I will tell you, when you're working on something, uh, you don't ever want to modify the wiring or anything on an airbag system. Don't want to do it on cruise control. Anything like that that can cause somebody some really serious issues, you don't want to be the person. There's your word for the day, by the way, delectation. So remember, you got to look that one up. Uh, you'll have a vocabulary test at the end of the term. Okay. But let's start with uh, question number one. A vehicle being repaired after an airbag deployment. Technician A says the inflator module should be handled as if it's still alive. Technician B says rubber gloves should be worn to prevent skin irritation. Who's correct about that? B both of them. Why would you handle it as it's still alive if it was stages, deployed? Because two stages, you don't know if the second stage is Exactly. Right. If it's a new generation, it's got two stages. The other one, you know, can light off. And there was a buddy of mine that, there's this, there was this Mercury Cougar that came in that had deployed the airbags on the car hauler. It was a brand new car. And uh, they, they had stopped at some dealership up in the country, and they just popped another airbag in there and plugged it back in and went on their way. And so uh, they wanted them to check to make sure that there wasn't any kind of uh, problem with it that was going to cause issues. And this one guy was looking at the airbag module, and he was pulling it out. The, and the other guy pulled the airbag out of the dash with the wire still plugged into it and turned it over and looked at the back side of it and put it back in there. And about the time he got his hands off of it, the other guy turned the module and the airbag lit off. Boom! It's like a boxing glove in the face, you know? And so if he'd had that thing off and turned it around when it lit off, it took his head off. Yeah, it was like, it's not to be sneezed at. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we gave you a worksheet telling you about how to disable the airbags. You know, and uh, how, how to do that the right way you do it, do it safely. And what you do after you disable them, let's say you got a problem with your airbag system. Let's say it's throwing you a code that says that the airbag is not there or something. And you want to make sure that you can check your circuits and all without accidentally lighting the dang airbag off because you don't take an ohm meter and hook it up to the two wire and go into the airbag, right? I mean, this is not a good plan to do that because the ohm meter does what? Just use some voltage through there. So if the airbag lights off, it's one guy that stopped went to the Chevrolet place and Randy Wilson told me about that. And he, and he had a little Chevy Avio or something, I don't know what it was. But anyway, he, he was going to change his ignition switch. So he pulls the airbag and the steering wheel out, all that kind of stuff, and he changes his ignition switch. He puts it all back together. But in so doing, he manages to pinch one of the wires going to the airbag. So when you switch on a vehicle, the electronic modules, what they'll do is they send a little shot of voltage up through all of the sensors and all the actuators and everything and see if it comes back on the other side, you know, because they got two wires up to them. So this thing shot voltage up there, and whenever it, it came back, it found ground on the airbag. So when he turned on the key, it went boom, blew up in his face. And he had a big raspberry on the side of his head, you know, where he got. So what I mean is, don't take, you take it seriously, man. The airbag stuff is not fun. And you, you might have seen the, how many of y'all saw the, the video of, of the, when I lit the one off in the, in the car? Yeah. yeah. Now, you know what that's like if you're sitting there when you're working on it. So don't, you know, don't say, well, it'd be I eight, you know, and just pull this thing off. No. A seatbelt pretensioner is what? All the All yeah, used to force the occupant back into position against the seat back in the event of a collision. You remove slack from the seat belt in the event of a collision, a device that has an explosive charge. That's what I was showing this while ago for. This is one of those at a pretension. I replaced that one because it didn't, this uh, squib firecracker in here lost its, uh, lost its continuity. It's supposed to have two ohms resistance and it didn't have any. Of course, it's really that a cardinal sin to measure that with a meter, but that one there, actually, it was turned out to be a bad one. And so when I put it on there, the airbag light went away. Uh, what conducts power and ground to the driver's side airbag? A. A, it's going to be the clock spring. The, basically, the clock spring. You know what the clock spring is? You ever seen one? Um, this. And this one here is tore up. But that's what a clock spring looks like. You notice it's a printed circuit. And this one, like I say, that one there. And here's here's something else you got to know. Pay, pay close attention to this, guys. Don't... don't um, Let's say uh, you bring your vehicle in, and uh, is you, maybe let's say your own vehicle, and it needs a, maybe the, the uh, uh, rack is leaking, the rack and pinion is leaking. So you pull the rack and pinion off, and in the midst of all this kind of thing, somehow or another, when you put it back on, you know, your, uh, the rack's all the way to one side or the other, or maybe the steering wheel's turned this way or another, and all that kind of thing. Maybe you have to turn the wheels, you know, and all that. When you put it back on, that the rack is in the center, but the wheels 
return. That means the clock spring is wound all the way up, just as tight as you can wind it. But you've got to have be able to turn the wheel both ways an equal number of turns, like two and three quarter turns each way. Uh, and you turn it and it does this. It rips the doggone thing apart. Okay, now this one guy that was working, uh, he works over in Andalusia. He works over in Andalusia, the dealership right now. But when he was in here, he had a little Honda car. A little, uh, and he changed his rack. And when he got through, he had bobbled the bottle. Didn't listen when we were talking about airbags in class because he didn't think anything about it. And the first time he turned his steering wheel, his airbag clock spring broke and he cost himself $475. Mm. Now, the, the clock spring for a Ford Ranger usually costs about 50 bucks. They don't cost that much. But a clock spring for some of these Asian makes, like the Toyotas and stuff like that, that's when you find out what those are made of. When you start buying parts for them, they'll eat you for lunch. Uh, we had a, a Ford 500 in here. We put a, a uh, throttle body and we put an accelerator pedal on it. Right. Both of those parts together was $145. That's the whole accelerator pedal with all the sensors and the throttle body. And that same week, there was a guy that I know that came in here and he had a vapor pressure sensor on his little Toyota Camry that needed to be replaced. And this sensor is a little plastic thing. It's so small, you can put it in your mouth and close your mouth and nobody knows it's in there. And it was over $200 mm -hmm. for this little bitty sensor and the whole this other stuff, you know, for that form was not that eBay. All right, so if you can get it off eBay. Okay. Uh, when 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 will a side or a curtain airbag airbag be deployed? Uh, if the vehicle rolls over. In the event of a hard impact to the side, if you get hit from the side, the sensors will light those off. And I tell you, those airbags will really protect you because they'll you know a lot of people die because their head hits the B pillar whenever they have they get T-boned, mm -hmm. and that thing pops up, it cushions and it keeps you from having head damage off of that thing right there. Uh, let me ask you this: if I ran a 2009 uh, Impala and a 1959 Chevrolet Biscayne together, which one would you rather be riding in if they were going like 50 mm -hmm. miles an hour and they ran head on? The Impala. No, the older one. The older one, I'll show you, I can show you a YouTube video on that where the insurance people did that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, that uh, newer yeah, car, <laughs> that 09 model car, the dummy had no significant injuries and the other car, it just crushed him. Because back in those days, they didn't make them be crash worthy. Now, the metal was heavier, but the car wasn't made to protect the occupants at all. And the seat belts weren't even required back then in 59. But, um, okay, uh, what color are the airbag electrical connectors and the conduit? Yellow. yellow. You might have seen the yellow on that when I held up a while ago. There, typically. Now, I will tell you this. It depends on the age of the car. Some of the earlier cars back in the late 80s, early 90s, you might not see yellow conduit and yellow back So. Don't assume they're always going to be yellow, but in the newer ones, that's pretty much a standard thing. Uh, what about on hybrid vehicles? How, what are the high voltage wires? What color are they? Orange. Uh, orange wires, yeah. What about on Chevy vehicles that have got 36 volt systems? What are they? What, say that again? 36 volt Chevy. Uh, Green. Yeah, and they're, they're blue. Green. They're blue, actually. You'll know, yeah. I just know it's orange because I've been reading that sign like yeah. for three weeks. Yeah, it's yeah. so yeah. a hybrid thing, yeah. Right. <laughs> hey. All right. There you um, go. How many sensors must be triggered at the same time to cause an airbag deployment? That's sort of foggy. That's two. Uh, technically two, but uh, a lot of them have just got one airbag sensor that's built into the module uh, for, the, for the, you know, forward, it, it, it'll slap forward. In the olden days, the airbag sensors had a little gold-plated steel ball that was stuck to a magnet, and it, was, and it had a tunnel, and down at the end of that tunnel there were two wires. And if you hit hard enough, it would break that ball loose from that magnet and it'd roll down there. You know these people that you see on some of these movies that take a, I don't know, I think it was a Die Hard, uh, Live Free or Die Hard, whatever it was. That kid got out and he got something like a stool like that and hit the front of the car and made the airbag run off. That's hogwash. <laughs> the car, the whole car's got to stop. You can't just hit it with something. You know, if that was the case, people would go through the parking lot getting the cars and blowing up airbags, you know. I mean, that's just dumb. You know? um, I would do that, too. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, well, you do. Yeah, break the headlight. What are the shorting bars? Where are shorting bars used? Airbag connectors. Yeah, as a matter of fact, on this one here, Right in there, when you unplug it, see that little metal part right there? Mm -hmm. When you unplug the airbag, that little shorting bar jumps up and it touches both of those terminals. When you plug the connector back in, it pushes the shorting bar out of the way so the terminals can be connected. And the reason they do that 
is there won't any static electricity that happens to go in there not to light off the bag or the pretensioner or whatever you're holding in your hand. You know. the deal. This right here is another clock spring, by the way, that's intact. See that? See how you can you can roll it and it stops. And if it's all the way to the stop, what you're supposed to do when you reset it, and I meant to say this while ago and I dropped the ball, what you got to do is you got to turn it all the way until it stops and then go back two and three quarter turns. And then that way your steering wheel got all the turns it needs. See what I mean? That's what you do on that typically. All right, just remember that. And that one there wants to keep falling on the floor. Uh, oh, it slapped the taste out of its mouth. Okay, let's see. Uh, Ooh, the heater uses blank to heat the air inside the vehicle on most vehicles. Hot coolant from the engine run through a heater board. Hey, you're a smart guy. Okay, and that's number nine. Where in the air three. conditioning system is the refrigerant a low pressure gas? The evaporator. The evaporator outlet. Mm. It's it not. Doesn't say. It, mm -hmm. Where? I it's not going to be a low pressure gas. It doesn't dealing. say. You just got to figure it, it think out. About, think about what you're doing. What you're doing. When the evaporator, what's going on in the evaporator? It's evaporating. Then it's gas. evaporating. It can't evaporate if it's already a low pressure gas, right? Yeah. So as it evaporates, what happens? You know, I'll read to you where I found it. You that. ever get out of the swimming pool on a cold day and you're cold? Yeah. Why? Compress low pressure gas refrigerant from the evaporator into a high pressure gas. That's Why do you get cold minutes. when you get out of the swimming pool? But if you, put, if I had this, uh, some alcohol here, and I put it and I pulled my hand out and I waved it around, my hand's gonna feel cold, right? Mm -hmm. Why does it feel cold? It. It's evaporating and it's carrying heat with it when it evaporates. So when you boil water, uh, if I'm boiling water and I check the temperature of this water while I'm boiling, that's I got an open pan on the stove, stick a thermostat in it. And a, I mean a thermometer, and I turn that thing all the way up. When it starts boiling, what's the temperature? Two twelve. How? I mean, can I get it any hotter than that? Yeah. How? Possibly. It won't get any hotter than two twelve. Oh yeah, because it turns into a gas, and then you can't. Uh, what? How? What's the temperature of the steam? Probably hotter than two twelve. It's the same temperature. That's the latent heat of vaporization. But if I wanted to make it boil at a higher temperature, I could add some antifreeze to it. And that would raise the boiling point. I could also put it under pressure. But like a pressure cooker, that would raise the boiling point. See what I mean? If you go to Denver, a mile above sea level, mile high city, uh, you're basically going to, how much is a mile again? Oh, shoot. 5,280 feet. 5,280 feet. Say that with me. 5,280 feet. 1,760 yards. Okay. How many How many uh, meters in a kilometer? Don't embarrass me, guys. Come on. How many meters are there in a kilometer? A thousand. A thousand, yeah. <laughs> That's not complicated. Okay. Or did you think it was a trick question or something? Yeah, I was okay. like. All right. <laughs> All right, where in the air conditioning system is the refrigerant a high pressure liquid? Condenser inlet or condenser outlet. Oh, let me ask you this. What's going on in the condenser? It's being I said evaporator in It's condensing. What's condensing mean? It's turning from a gas into a liquid. So it's not a liquid until it leaves the condenser. As it turns into a liquid, it gives off heat. Oh. You got that? It gives off heat as it turns into a liquid. So that's what it does. Where did you get the heat that you're needing to give off? You know? In the evaporator. As it was evaporated, it absorbed heat in the evaporator, and the suction line should be cold all the way to the compressor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're charging up something like a piece of farm equipment or something, of course, they'll never release any refrigerant in the atmosphere. Or you'll have to get a $10,000 fine and get locked up, and they'll stand you on your head under the water and, you know, hit you on the bottom of the feet with sharp objects and stuff like that. But uh, what you need to do, if you're charging up like a tractor, let's say I'm charging up the AC on an air-conditioned tractor, and I don't know how much it's supposed to be in there. I mean, you know, there's not any book around there. And I'm going to keep putting refrigerant in there until that suction line gets cold all the way to the compressor. And when the suction line is cold all the way to the compressor, I know I've got enough for it to work right. You got that? That's not complicated, is it? I mean, you, you can take the mystery out of it like that. But, um, Anyway, uh, so let me see. Uh, the material used to absorb moisture, absorb moisture inside an AC system, is called what? 
The dryer. Huh? The dryer. No, the desiccant. Have you ever seen a little packs of stuff that comes in a bottle of uh, vitamin pills? Says dry. Yeah, it just says dryer. Right? Yeah. What's the stuff that actually is in the dryer, though? That's what they're talking about. Oh, no, oh, yep. Didn't read that. Desiccant. <laughs> desiccant. D E S I C. And you know the little thing that says, the little pack of stuff that says desiccant, do not eat? Have you ever seen that in your little bottle of vitamin pills? And uh, that's what that is. They basically absorb moisture. Now, what do we use for a desiccant in salt? Rice. Rice. Rice, exactly. So, so rice is a desiccant. And if you dropped your uh, satellite phone in the water in the middle of Iraq and everything and you need to call uh, maybe some uh, air support to come in, but your phone's been wet, what do you do? Rice. So you bury rice. it in rice. That does not work. And it draws it out all that Sometimes kind of stuff. I've killed four phones. And this guy looks out across the desert and he sees these strange green halos coming. And somebody says, what is that? Aliens? And he says, no, it's worse. It's Marines. Yeah. They got their little, you know, propellers on their Ospreys and whipping up that static electricity out there. Okay, now then, so... The customer complains the heater works sometimes, but only cold air comes out while driving. Technician A says the AC system may not have enough refrigerant in the system. Uh, technician B says the coolant system could be low on coolant. Who's right about that? So the computer, the heater works sometimes, but only cold air comes out while driving. What are you going to tell them? Uh, I'd say technician. Yeah, well, the AC refrigerant keep the heater from working. Okay, so. have you ever seen it low on coolant and keep the heater from working? When you're filling up a coolant system on a car, you better... When you're finished... I told you. Hey, there you are. Yeah. I laid my key on your desk. I'll call you. All right. Um, anyway, uh, so I used to walk, uh, I used to drive this uh, 69 LTD when I was in high school. And, uh, what is it? LTD? Uh, well, it's like a Crown Victoria, except they used to call it an LTD. It stood for limited, you know, sort, I guess, or whatever. But anyway, uh, it had a 390 in it. And me and the girl that rode to high school with me, Sometimes when it's really, 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 really cold, we wind up with no heat because my water pump was leaking. And so what I would do is stop at the country store there before it opened because back in those days, gas stations all had a water hydrant or a, or a can and air out there by the gas pumps, you know, all that stuff going all the way down. But anyway, I'd pull over there and the gas station wouldn't even open yet, but I'd pop the hood on that LTD and, uh, and I'd turn that radiator cap, you know, and then I'd dive out of the way and I'd fill it up with water and Put it back on, we'd have good heat. <laughs> Maybe see the thing about it, that's the first time I ever learned that was if we ain't got no coolant, I mean, we're low on coolant because the heat went away. And that was in the wintertime, you know. Uh, so always, if you're filling the coolant system up and you want to make doggone sure that it's full, and another, I have another indicator of it anyway, when you keep putting it in there and pour it in and the thermostat opens and all that, if you've got the heater on and you feel heat coming out of the heater, you got a pretty good idea that the, that your coolant, you know, you got enough coolant in there. Um, of course, it also needs to be hot in there where the radiator is too. If it's a radiator cap, but if it's got that surge tank, you know those things are almost for self bleeding. But you still need to keep a gun on them while you're warming them up. And the fan needs to kick on and off about three or four times. Uh, the first step in solving a diagnostic procedure, excuse me, in a diagnostic procedure when attempting to solve an HVAC customer problem is what? C customer. You always got to verify the concern. Um, I always like to tell this story when we're talking about HVAC. Uh, one time sitting right here on this lift here, there was a uh, 85 Buick Riviera, and we were supposed to check the AC on it. And so I was watching the compressor under the hood, and I told Jerry Littlefield, I said, Jerry, get in there and turn the air conditioner on in the car and see if the compressor comes on. And uh, so Jerry gets in there, and Jerry, he's sitting in there, sitting in the car, and he's looking around. I said, oh, good grief. He's one of these guys that can take a, you know, a five-second you know, five job and make it last three minutes, you know. You ever seen somebody like that? They should have already got this done, and they're, you're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And he gets out, and he's all red-faced and everything. He goes, I don't guess I know how to turn the air conditioner on this car. And so I said, oh, come on, Jerry, come on. So I got in there, and I sat down, and I looked at it for a while, <laughs> just like he did. But it turned out it had one of them CRT screens in the middle of the dash. You never think of that. You can look up a, you can Google the dash on an 85 Buick Riviera. It's got a little TV screen looking thing in the middle of the dash, and it was a touch screen. And whether you're doing radio, air conditioner, or whatever, you had to select which panel you wanted to put up there. 
and so you'd actually you'd put AC, and then it would give you the blower and the AC controls. But if you hit radio, it'd give you the radio controls. It was really unusual. They were trying to get all, you know, Rubieras used to have crazy, uh, sort of like Ford Thunderbirds back in the old days. They tried to make it look like a spaceship. Okay, let me see. Technician A says spark, knock, ping, and detonation are different names for abnormal combustion. Technician B says any abnormal combustion raises the temperature and pressure inside the combustion chamber and can cause severe engine damage. See. Have you ever heard this pinging noise that comes whenever you've got whenever you're trying to use gas that's no good? Or when you're going up a hill, they call it valve clatter, but that's not what it is. It's basically combustion that's happening before the piston gets to the top, and it's happening before it's supposed to, either because the timing is too uh, advanced too much or the engine's running hot. If you're driving an engine that's running hot, it'll start lighting off the fuel mix before the piston gets to the top, and that flame front hits the piston and rings it like a bell, cling, 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 cling. You know, it makes a little a pinging noise and all that. So 14 should be C. If you didn't put C in there, mark it wrong and slap yourself. Okay, propane is also called what? What is propane called? LPG, liquid propane gas. Everybody put that same answer? Everybody got it wrong. It's CNG, compressed, CNG. compressed natural gas. I got it wrong because I put A. I'm sorry. You guys are right and I'm wrong. LPG, mark me wrong and uh, make me slap myself. Yeah, I looked at that answer wrong. I, should, I knew better than that too. I don't know what I was thinking about. That's LPG. Duh. What an idiot. Techni the vehicle owner should what? The vehicle owner. I was talking about myself. The vehicle owner should do what? A. Purchase gasoline that has the octane rating recommended for use as stated in the owner's manual. B. Use plus grade for all gasoline engines. C. Use premium grade for all engines best performance or what? B and C. Now, if you're actually, um, I do not like putting premium gas in anything that's not set up for it. Uh, there's technical service bulletins from Ford and Chrysler that say don't do that because what happens is, what's the difference between premium gas and regular gas? Higher octane. Yeah, I know, but you've got to do better than that. I know it's higher octane. Don't start well, with me. One will ignite before the other one. One burns faster. Which one burns faster? I believe 81 burns faster, doesn't it? Well, the, the lower the octane, the faster it burns. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the higher octane burns slower, if the engine's not set up for it, it's going to leave stuff in there that's going to turn into tar and grunge and carbon and all that. And over time, carbon cakes up on your cylinder head and it increases the compression ratio and that begins to cause ping and destination that would not happen if you hadn't been putting premium gas in it. Furthermore, you're paying more for premium gas. If the vehicle's set up to run on premium gas, that's a different story. If it's a, you know, one of them super duper hot rod, you know, turbo or uh, supercharged cars, you know, it's probably set up to run on 93. If it says put 93 in it, put 93 in it. If it says put 87, put 87. The correct answer to that one is A. Some cars will tell you about the filler net. Some Corvettes will tell you. Yeah, they will. Uh, E85, that's a good place for them to put it too, right? Okay, it's about the filler neck. Uh, E85 can blank. All of the, uh, all of the above. above. Uh, if you use it in a non-flex fuel gasoline engine, the alcohol attacks the injectors and the lines and all that stuff. That's why I said if you can get a flex fuel car, even if you don't intend to burn flex fuel, you're getting a better fuel system. Basically. Like it'll last longer? Yeah, you got a more solid, you got injectors are better, fuel pumps better, fuel lines are better, the inside of the tank's treated a different way. You got a better fuel system with a flex fuel vehicle. And there's a lot of cars that are flex fuel vehicles driving around that you don't ignore flex fuel. Because they don't always have a badge on them. Like, that Suburban up on the uh, lift, it's a flex fuel vehicle. It doesn't say it on anywhere, but it is. How do I know this? Well, how can you tell if it's a flex fuel vehicle? It's got that little canister thingy that compensates for EA5 underneath it. It's, well, it's got a basically a fuel compensation sensor. Yeah, that thing. And, uh, see, it? see that thing right there? Lee, grab that thing right there. See that uh, muddy thing? That's it. That's it. That's a fuel compensation sensor off of a Chevy. That's what that is. And it's basically supposed to tell the PCM how much alcohol is in the fuel so it can change the fuel strategy. If you buy one of those at the GM dealer, it's $700. Okay. What's wrong with this one? It was, to, it was lying about the amount of alcohol that was in a, uh, a uh, Tahoe that we were working on, and it was making it start hard. Why was it making it start hard? Because if it thinks it's got alcohol in it, it puts more fuel in there when you're starting it and it's wetting the spark plugs. 
And all I had to do was call them and say, look, what are you running in this thing? You know, what, I mean, you're running flex fuel, whatever. Because it's showing, the scan tool showed 45% alcohol. And they said, we never use that crap. We always use plain, use plain old gas. And that told me that that thing was telling a lie. And then it was causing uh, issues with that. Um, but anyway, uh, the, we've got two college vehicles. We've got a Dodge Stratus and a, uh, you might have seen that gray van that y'all work on when you're doing it. Uh, that one is flex fuel and so is the Stratus, but it doesn't say it anywhere on the car. You can look at the eighth digit on the serial number and tell if it's flex fuel. All right, flex fuel, oh, here we go. Flex fuel vehicle can be identified by what? Any of the above. Any of the above, but not all of the above. They don't always have emblems. Um, and you know, usually the vendor of the VCI is more um, reliable than any kind of an emblem you might see on the side. Uh, what color is diesel fuel dyed if it's for off-road use only? We knew about that, right? Mm -hmm. And you ought to avoid topping off your gas tank because... It goes into the expansion tank. The charcoal canister may get saturated. Wait, wait. Mm -hmm. Charcoal canister. This is a charcoal canister on this picture right here. If it gets saturated, now there's the expansion area. Uh, but if, it, oh, if yeah. you get enough in there to where it goes over here and gets in this thing. Now, let me tell you how that manifests itself. There was a lady that called me one time, and she said, uh, well, when I was at the dealership, they called me out there and talked to her on the phone. And uh, she said, sometimes when I'm sitting at a traffic signal on my 98 Windstar or whatever it was, she says, uh, all of a sudden, the engine will almost die, and then it will catch itself and speed up, and it would surge ahead, and I'll almost run into the vehicle in front of me. And, um, and I told them, uh, I told her, I says, are you packing your gas tank? When you gas it up, she says, no, I always do that. <laughs> and I said, well, quit packing your gas tank and it'll stop doing that. Well, see, in the olden days, the canister purge only purged whenever you were into the throttle at the same time it was giving the EGR. Nowadays, it's liable to sit there when it's just idling and start purging. And if it does that and it slugs the manifold with gasoline, it's going to almost die and then the idle air control is going to open up and it's going to surge ahead. So uh, that's one of the things you can look at. You can watch your scan tool, and when it tells you, if you're watching it, when it starts purging, if the engine almost dies, you'll know they've been packing their gas tank. But you just about got to have a wind engine system to tell that. Any questions or comments? And what do you know now that you didn't know before? Tell me something you learned in this class session today. Uh, don't pack the fuel tank. Don't pack the fuel tank. That's the most recent thing I said. That's a five. That's all right, though. You learned it. All right. Do you ever pack the gas tank? I learned what shorting bars were. Yeah, yeah. I had, uh, shorting bars. I had no clue what shorting bars were. Yeah. Never heard of them. Yeah, shorting bar. Well, now you've heard of them. What about you? Ah, uh, just disconnect everything before you take it out. Yeah. You already do that. Well, you all. I mean, what else do you do prior to disconnecting the airbag? I mean, what if you're disconnecting the airbag and it goes, boom? You don't want that to happen either. What do you got to do first? You well, guys, some of you guys have done worksheets. Pull the negative battery, 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 battery. battery. Disconnect the battery and uh, wait for how long? You said this the other day. When Five, ten minutes? Yeah. Whatever the book says. i tell you something else on your hybrid vehicles. Whenever you pull that hybrid, that service plug, you got to wait until all those big capacitors in there bleed down. Have you ever seen somebody uh, charge up a big capacitor and then, and then uh, discharge it? I mean, like a big capacitor, like one that's like this big around that long. they got several of them lagging up in a bank in them hybrid. <laughs> And whenever they, you charge it up, uh, well, you know what a capacitor is to begin with, right? It's like a battery, but it only stores the juice for just a minute. You know, uh, in a distributor, you had a little condenser, it looked like a firecracker, remember that? You take that condenser, it looks like a firecracker, you lay it on the engine block, and you can actually let the spark jump to it. Bap, 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 bap. I'm talking about the wire going into it, and it stores all that energy in there. And you can bend it around and touch it. Of course, if you happen to touch it yourself, it'll light you up like a Christmas tree. Yeah, you know, fire you up. And that kind of, and used to, one of the first things you learn when you're working in a shop where a bunch of old mechanics were, if you see one of those things laying there, don't pick it up and fool around and touch both wires because you're going to get bit. Because a lot of these knotheads would charge it up and lay it on the bench because there's some young whippersnapper who's going to want to pick it up and get fired up. You know what I mean? Also, <laughs> here's the other thing. Really what I also there. used to do when I was working at the Ford dealership, we had gasket glue, right, that we get from the parts and we could only get a, a can ever so often because they didn't want you getting a new fresh can of gasket glue every time you did a car. And so people would come by my workbench and they'd see it there. I had 25 mechanics in there. They'd come by there and they would take my dead gum gasket glue. I say, so what are you going to do to keep them from stealing your gasket glue? You got to be creative now. Swap, uh, put something that was there. 
well, that's not a bad idea, but I'm kind of wanting some gaskets, but I'm afraid I'll pick up that thing and put whatever that something else is on my gasket. I took a round oil can. We used to use round oil cans. You ever go round oil cans that they used to have? And I cut the bottom out of it, of a junky old grungy looking round oil can, and I set it 